five. Dharma is just too hesitant and too wooden. And in some ways, Sunak as a kind of enthusiastic university debating champion type did rather well. Four. The public wants to know that the public finances are in safe hands. What they really want is leadership. Three. The t- truth of the matter is, I'm not sure how well a Tony Blair-like figure would go down at the moment. I know people who are not fans of Nigel Farage at all, and they're really glad he's standing. We needed something to change the temperature, and this has certainly had that kind of an impact. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with me, Liam Halligan, and ordinarily Alison Pearson. But the esteemed co-pilot's away for a well-earned rest this week. I think she's gone cat hunting in Turkey again. So I'm delighted to be joined in the cockpit by Planet Normal regular and all-round good egg, Baroness Claire Fox. Claire, great to have you with us of the Rocket of Right Thinking. It's great to be back here, especially because this election needs a bit of a rocket, so I'm in the right place. (laughs) A bit of joystick wrestling, as they say. (laughs) So, Claire, the general election campaign is hotting up, not least given the declaration by some bloke called Nigel Farage that he's running for Parliament again. And also Tuesday night's TV debate on ITV, the first in a series of televised leaders debates expected ahead of the general election on July the 4th. And already the fingers are being pointed. The political fur is flying. The Tories are claiming Labour will raise household taxes by two grand, as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak claimed repeatedly when facing off against Keir Starmer. Liar, liar, pants on fire, cried the Labour stormtroopers. The mass of increasingly disciplined, even robotic shadow cabinet campaigners surrounding the Labour leader. But are exchanges like this, heated arcane rows about the detailed assumptions behind economic forecasts years hence, which will likely be totally wrong anyway, are they the stuff of the UK's vibrant democracy in action? Or are they just the latest turn-off for a long-suffering, cheesed-off British public in what could turn out to be a none-of-the-above election? with voter turnout historically low. Oh well, at least our election isn't yet as crazy as that in the US, ahead of a presidential election on November the 5th. Already we've seen campaigning fireworks though, with speculation rife about Joe Biden's mental stability, and Trump of course now a convicted felon. Resident Baroness, you bring with you to Planet Normal a wealth of experience, drawn from your Irish Welsh roots, your times as social worker, teacher, and intellectual entrepreneur, not least as the founder of the Academy of Ideas. Instinctively of the libertarian left, you stood for the Brexit Party and now ply your trade, of course, as a much-admired, non-affiliated, fiercely independent member of the House of Lords. Great to have you back, Claire. And let me start by asking you this. Were you surprised that Nigel Farage, someone you know pretty well, threw his hat in the ring in Clacton? I think I was actually more surprised, if not shocked and actually rather disturbed by the fact that Nigel Farage didn't throw his hat in the ring 10 days ago or whenever it was. And (laughs) the whole thing rather felt like a great letdown. And I know a lot of people, not because they're particularly, you know, supporters of Nigel Farage, just felt as though it was turning his back on everything that you would need to liven this election up, especially when he said, what's the UK election anyway, when America's the big deal type of thing. So, yeah, that was a bit of a shock. So in some ways, the fact that he changed his mind and actually his statement explaining that he'd really felt a bit guilty and he kept being approached by people, I think actually did give a little frisson of excitement to what is a very dull election campaign. You at least felt something was happening. And I know people who are not fans of Nigel Farage at all and they're really glad he's standing so that'll show you we needed something to change the temperature and this has certainly had that kind of an impact. Now you famously of course from the left of politics stood for the Brexit party as I said you became an MEP alongside Nigel Farage until the UK left the European Union just tell us a bit more about the man and why you think He's opted to stand after all. And what you think, Claire Fox, will happen in Clacton on July the 4th? The sitting MP, or who was a sitting MP, is a pretty hardline Brexiteer, you know, opposed to the smoking ban. I recently spoke on a panel with him on that very issue, very much a Clapton 
MP. So to kind of unseat him will be difficult for Nigel Farage. He's certainly not a shoe in in the area. But on the other hand, he had a big rally yesterday and people were out. And as I say, it's become a national talking point. I mean, I can't claim to know Nigel particularly well, but when I worked with the Brexit party when I was an MEP, one of the things that you do know, which is why I was so surprised that he got the tone so wrong initially, is that he has got a finger on the pulse of what people are interested in. And, I, I, you know, your introduction, you made the point that there's this massive row about the starmer Sunak debate last night in terms of this £2,000 tax issue. And after you've heard it for about two minutes, you just want to fall asleep. And it seems completely to miss the mood of the moment, which is people are concerned about a massive range of issues. And it's not just the economy, stupid, or anything else. It's the whole cultural disorientation that people feel about debates around whether it's massive demonstrations on the streets of London regularly, two-tier policing, worries about immigration, concern about housing, all sorts of things. Just to reduce it down to such a technical matter of the whether the £2,000 is accurate is something that I think Farage would never do. And that's to go back to him. He's got a bit more of a temperamental sense of the fact that you need to have a different conversation. You know, I so concur with what you're saying. And I'm the bloke who actually reports in detail on all these kind of weird rows about fiscal policy. Let's be completely clear. What are they arguing about? Rishi Sunak on Tuesday night, as you said, during that ITV debate, he kept wielding this new Tory attack line. Labour are going to put your taxes up by £2,000 per household, which sounds like a lot of money. And of course, it is a lot of money. It turns out, though, we learn on Wednesday morning, a cabinet minister under pressure from an interviewee was forced to admit that £2,000 is actually over four years. It's not per year. OK, it's still a lot of money. It then turns out that Tories who said that these were Treasury numbers, uh, well, the Permanent Secretary of the Treasury has something to say about that. While there is some Treasury analysis in these numbers, the Treasury Perm Sec, obviously somebody who is presented as completely scrupulously neutral, particularly during election campaign, the Treasury Perm Sec issued a public letter saying this is not entirely Treasury analysis and it shouldn't be presented as such. Now, as you say, even though I'm obviously seriously interested in economics and have a certain fluency, I think it's fair to say, with all these issues. I just know this isn't connecting with the public when they're watching, because in the end, these are forecasts three, four and five years hence. And economic forecasts are nearly always blown completely off course, particularly when you're talking about particular highways and byways of the intricacies of the national accounts. And for Labour and the Tories to be arguing over what are effectively rounding errors in public spending, you know, in 2028 and 2029, based on what they might do if they possibly get into government. I don't think the public wants that. The public wants to be reassured that both the main parties, all the parties, if they get into power, will be responsible with our public finances, not least because our public finances are in an incredibly weak position, particularly compared to say 1997, national debt then was 30% of GDP. Now it's almost 100% of GDP. Interest rates are sky high in the sense that the government's spending 40, 50 billion quid a year on debt interest. The public wants to know that the public finances are in safe hands. What they really want is leadership. They want a sense of where we're going as a country and what Labour and the Tories are going to do specifically that's going to help themselves and their family. And this endless arcane fighting about technical assumptions behind even more technical economic forecasts, it's a complete turnoff. Completely. And if you're going to focus on the state of the economy, what you want to hear from that leadership is not only just the discussion that you've just initiated so interestingly about public finances and the kind of things that people might be interested in, But you want to have a sense that there's a plan for creating a dynamic economy. The way that the £2,000 is bandied around, it was as though they think that the voters only care about pounds and pence in a technical sense. Whereas, of course, people need money, but they want to know that, well, is there going to be new industry? Is there going to be jobs created? And the things that cost money, for example, what's going to happen about social care? the kind of things that worry people about not having enough money or 
What's going to happen to the kids not being able to buy a house? What's happening to the rented sector? Is there going to be any, any social housing? So I'm not suggesting that you only discuss kind of the big culture wars issues that I'm interested in. You should discuss the economy. That's what leadership would mean. But not in the sense of them trying to bribe almost the voters or say they'll steal your money, they'll take your money, we'll give you a bit more money. Because that's because they can't believe that voters think anything other than you know, pounds and pence in a very narrow technical fashion. They got that bit wrong with Brexit, if you remember. They were forever saying, oh, you know, we leave the EU, you're going to be worse off. And people said, yeah, thank you, we're leaving anyway. There's more important things than that. And you mentioned that, you know, political shorthand, the economy's stupid. That was, of course, the phrase used by James Carville, Bill Clinton's legendary political advisor, when the comeback kid from Arkansas was gunning for the White House at Race he won, of course. And I've spoken to James Carville about this, big clanky name drop, but it's true. And <laughs> what he was talking about, we forget, he wasn't talking about, oh, you know, hit people on the phones when you're campaigning and on the doorsteps with your latest whizzy economic forecast and your technical assumptions. The economy, stupid, was about saying to voters, do you feel better off than four years ago? Yeah. Has your life improved under the other lot over the last four years? And if it hasn't, try us, right? It wasn't about we're going to promise you some technocratic sunlit upland and look at my Excel spreadsheet and how plausible it all is and I've got a nerd's army backing me up. That's not what they were saying. But in recent years, as the cost of living crisis has bit, as politics has been done so much more technocratic it seems to be like you know forecast wars everybody angsting about all the obr says that in 2031 you can spend an extra two billion quid yeah this is absurd this is absurd that's what's happened i think that that's the mistake that's happening actually that the democrats are making in america as well isn't it because biden's crowd and the democrats can say look look at the forecast we're doing all right you know it's not too bad but if you don't feel it it doesn't make any difference, right? right? And if you don't trust them, it's not because uh, perception and, and fact are different, but because when they're doing economy by spreadsheet, they're misunderstanding that broader sense of what economic prosperity means. It, it doesn't just mean money. No. You have to have a sense that you can trust that your communities are going to be safe, that there is going to be such a thing as community. You worry about the fact that there's so much fragmentation. You worry about the fact that your kids, they're going to school and they're being introduced to anything from, you know, decolonising the curriculum to mad ideas around you know, multiple gender choices and so on and so forth. That might sound like it's got nothing to do with the economy, but if you want your kids to be educated so that they stand a chance in an economically dynamic economy, you need to know that those things are being resolved. So I think that Biden, and actually uh, this is a danger of both Sunak and Starmer, I don't think have quite understood the depth that they need to go into to reassure people that they have the political leadership that can take us out of what we know to be quite a difficult, deep malaise, both economically, but also socially, politically and culturally. I think campaigning by spreadsheets is a, a really good phrase. I think you've captured a lot of what's happening in the UK here. Look, I want to talk to you in detail about what you think the Conservative Party should be doing, what you think the Labour Party should be doing. But while we're at it, you did just mention the states. My column last week in the same Telegraph was about Biden and the economy and the fact that even though the US economy is going pretty well, grew by 3.5% last year, grew by 1.3% the first quarter of this year, outperforming pretty much every Western economy. As you say, the soccer mums and centrist dads of America are not feeling that upside in large part because inflation has been stubbornly high in the States. Inflation in the States is still up around 3.5%. It's gone up a bit in recent months rather than down. And expectations that the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, will be cutting rates three times in 2024. That was their own words, very much signaling to the market that multiple rate cuts were coming. The money markets are now betting that Fed rate cuts won't come until October, November, the first one. And in my view, that means that UK rate cuts won't come until then. But that aside... What do you think about this Trump conviction, Claire? Do you think it means he'll get more votes or less? So I think it looks as though he's going to get more votes. I, I think it's a very worrying 
really dangerous precedent that's been set here because it's undoubtedly the case that there was wrongdoing by Trump. But it's also the case that even if you're critical of Trump, you can see objectively that this was potentially a politicised use of the law, lawfare as people have called it, to destroy a democratic choice being offered to the American people. And guess what? The American voters have responded by saying, well, we're not going to allow you to do that. And so Trump's support has gone up as a consequence. The idea that he's a felon, that's a a a felon is a a, a serious accusation. And you've mentioned Bill Clinton. If you look at the sordid story of Bill Clinton and his affair and paying people off and all the rest of it, it's grim and it was grisly. And it seems like the Trump affair, right? So the idea that this is something... When you call somebody a felon, you hold them to account in a law court when nobody can see that this was a felony in all seriousness makes a mockery of the use of the law courts. And the judiciary, I think, have lost a huge amount of credibility. So I can't tell you how much I can't stand Trump, Donald Trump, right? And I wouldn't want the choice of Biden or Trump myself. But that's not the point. The point is, is that in a democratic election, he should be dealt with at the ballot box, not by people playing fast and loose with the law, just because they've got the power of the judiciary behind them. Claire, when we were kids, Starsky and Hutch aired in America. It came here. (laughs) Skateboards cropped up in America. They came here more recently. Cancel culture in America, it's come here. (laughs) And now we have so-called lawfare in America. Could it come here? I think it's already coming here. I mean, you know, we've had examples in Europe, at least, of this idea of suing countries on the climate change issue. And I know that there's great enthusiasm for people to say, oh, yeah, we should be able to sue political parties because they're not doing enough to, you know, arrive at net zero and that they're going to therefore damage us and so on and so forth. So you've got that side of it. We've already seen the way the Supreme Court has been called upon to block potentially democratic decisions and that's what the row over the European Court of Human Rights is that that is used to stop democratic decision making so I'm afraid that's only starting now and I get very nervous about it so do you think Trump's going to get it do you think he's going to be the next US president do you think Farage will be working alongside him if only via Zoom well I don't I've got I I think it might be more via Zoom and it depends but yeah that would be hilarious wouldn't it maybe Trump will come to Clapton (laughs) Um, uh, so I well you know that would be like a world historic moment Um, I think that Trump could get it I mean the main thing is there's no dynamic around Biden's campaign and it's not just a question of you know there's all sorts of you know queries around whether he has dementia and so on and so forth I'm not even going to comment but he doesn't instill one with great I mean you hardly sort of listen to him speak and think this is a man that should be in charge of the world You know what I mean? This is America we're talking about. So even though you might think Trump is crazy and unpredictable and not a serious politician, he appears to be a more dynamic, interesting leader than Biden ever could be. And the Biden administration has been very uh, disappointing, even for a lot of Democrats. I mean, we all know now that many people from ethnic minorities in America are switching to Trump, which is a you know, a big historic change. Hispanics for those people and African right. Americans are coming strongly exactly. for Trump, aren't they? Exactly, because they're pro-family or because they think the schools have gone to hell in a handcart. They're worried about what they see on university campuses. They're worried about the consequences of what some people kind of dismissively say is the culture wars. But these are real trends in society that affect ordinary people's lives and parents don't want their kids to be politicized at school in that way for example they worry about the fact that people were enthusiastic about defunding the police they worry about biden at the head of a a situation that refuses to acknowledge the difference and the distinction between biological sex and chosen gender in the trans rows and in relation to sport in america that's becoming an increasingly big issue of unfairness and Biden's oblivious to dealing with it. In fact, his administration has doubled down in in making things worse. So I'm not surprised to see people switch over to Trump, even though that as an alternative is hardly, you know, there's real problems with Trump. But yeah, I think he might do it. Yeah. Just while you're speaking, Claire, the little mischievous pocket of my mind, I was imagining a sort of sun front page this time next year. Trump buys Clacton Pier to build huge casino in a, in a business mega deal brokered by Farage. I mean, it sounds mad, but it might happen. 
It could it could so easily happen. I mean, I, I, I think Trump's probably at this stage got a slightly better chance than Farage has because Farage has got a hell of a lot of changing to do. And, and as everybody has noticed, just to go back to that a little bit, but it's because elections are a hard slog. And as people have often commented, it's a bit of a cliche, Farage is great at the air war, but it's much harder to have a ground war when you haven't got the data, you haven't got years of building up all the, the addresses of everybody who and the way people are going to vote and so on. So it is tough being a small insurgent party like reform. So we'll see whether that air campaign with reform and Farage's name being so well known is enough to take him over the line. I think, by the way, that this election is one of the elections that's really going to put a query over first past the post. I think more and more people are saying, what's the point of having a democratic system where representation doesn't happen? and where arguably millions of people will vote and they won't have any of their views represented in Parliament. And that is dangerous because it can make people cynical and nihilistic about the project of democracy per se, which is a very dangerous situation to be in, I think. And as you say, Reid Clacton, the local Tory incumbent, Giles Watling, is a highly respected local guy. He's been living in Clacton for a long time. So Nigel Farage certainly got his work cut out. And how interesting now in British politics, you've got an alliance forming, a highly unlikely alliance between the Lib Dems and the Greens on the one hand and Nigel Farage's Reform Party on the other, as you say, for proportional representation. I've obviously seen a lot of Nigel Farage over recent months and years at GB News, and we talk a lot about voting systems and the potential implications of reform of first past the post. A very, very interesting set of issues post-election, as you say, Claire. Just before we move on to our interview, Claire, what did you think last night watching that TV debate? How do you think Sunak did? Because most pundits, even through gritted teeth, say that he won. Yeah, no, I think he did win because I think that Starmer is just too hesitant and too wooden. And in some ways, uh, Sunak is a kind of enthusiastic university debating champion type did rather well. But the questions that we were talking about earlier was he did rather well in a technical sense of that particular debate. That's not the same as connecting with the electorate. That's not the same as actually having a conversation with the public. And by the way, I think the debate format that, you know, where the presenter says you've got 45 seconds to answer this. I mean, if anything's going to turn politics into a kind of nonsense game of sound bites, it's that. So I, I did think he won, but it's just that what did he win? Uh, people aren't now thinking, right, I'm definitely going to vote for the Conservatives after that. So we're reducing politics to almost like an entertainment game and I think that's again very dangerous because that's going to be a turn off to the voters and make them even more cynical and that's what I think we should try and avoid during this election but it's very difficult um, when faced with clever student politics like gotcha 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 but you know so what I must admit I agree with you Claire not least on that you got 45 seconds point I don't like to criticize fellow broadcasters and I think there's a lot about the debate that ITV did well but at some moments, the leaders were told, you've got four seconds, you've got 10 seconds. Think <laughs> back to when we were young, Claire. I was rummaging around on YouTube the other day and I came across this absolutely incredible episode. It was on ITV Sunday afternoon and it was a young Jonathan Dimbleby in his roll neck black jumper and it was Tony Benn and it was Roy Jenkins and they were discussing Europe and it was 45 minutes, and Dibbleby, to his credit, barely spoke because he was in the presence of two great orators with completely different points of view who both knew their stuff from their perspective. And it was such a joy to watch, and I learned so much from watching it. And all this stems from broadcasters' attitudes, in my view, that the plebs are too thick to really understand stuff unless it's boiled down to its essence. That is nonsense. That's complete nonsense. We have tens of thousands of people listening to this podcast every week, listening to two people talking in great detail about politics and society. And there are many, many other podcasts like us. Mainstream broadcasters have to understand that ordinary people do have attention spans. You can want to watch Love Island and still be interested in politics and policy. 
Absolutely right. I mean, you know, I'm Academy of Ideas, so this is absolutely what we argue all the time, because I think that that insulting the public by imagining that you need to give them a meme, and that's what we were saying earlier, the Tories probably think we got that £2,000 figure stuck in their heads. As though people don't go down the pub and have a conversation about what that means and then spend hours discussing it, right, in all seriousness and what they think about politics. Yeah. This podcast is a perfect example. But even my, you know, the young people in my family and friends, you know, the 20-somethings, the young students and so on, they're listening to these podcasts that go on for hours and hours. I don't even know how they've got the, got the patience to do it. But there's a thirst for depth. Not yep. pretentiousness, not yep. sort of nonsense. And the point that you made about Tony Benn, Jonathan Zimbel, that's how I learned about politics. Yep. You know, I wasn't in a family that, yeah, I, we weren't a family that had lots of books or anything, but we used to watch those kind of things. And I learned about the world, about politics. I was inspired by those politicians, not that I agreed with them, but I wanted to be somebody who knew as much as them. I wanted to read the books that would allow me to think like that. And the broadcasters insult the public, but the politicians do too. And one thing is, if we'd have just taken away the presenter, and there was nothing wrong with the presenter on the evening, but I, if you took the presenter away and you said, right, have a chat, boys, you know what I mean, carry on, I don't think they've got the depth to have that kind of conversation. Maybe they have, but we haven't seen any evidence of that from the political elite for quite some time. Now we're a broad-minded bunch on Planet Normal, which is why we bring you voices from across the political spectrum. And the emails you send us suggest that many of you appreciate our determination to challenge the groupthink that so often seems to characterise public discussions these days. With this in mind, I'm delighted to welcome someone highly respected by both myself and co-pilot Pearson, and I know Claire Fox as well. Matthew Larza is one of the sharpest campaigners on the centre-left of British politics. He joined the Labour Party aged 16 and has held a myriad of political jobs, from local branch official to key player in the Labour leader's office. Matthew was head of broadcasting for his party and senior advisor to Ed Miliband when he was Labour leader from 2010 to 2015, although Matthew wasn't involved, he says, in his then leader's decision to eat that bacon sandwich on camera. In the run up to Tony Blair's landslide in 1997, I was a young reporter on the Financial Times. That's when I first came across Matthew. He was national coordinator of Young Labour, dubbed the Blairite Praetorian Guard. And when not working for Labour, Matthews followed a successful career as a TV producer, pundit and policy wonk, working for various think tanks. I started by asking Matthew Laza how this current election campaign felt to him so far, a rerun of Labour's 1997 heyday or something else. I mean, in 1997, I had uh, hair and hope. I still have uh, hope personally, but the country certainly doesn't have the hope that it had in 1997. And that's not Labour's fault. It's just been browbeaten by a mixture of the Tory government. I would say that, wouldn't I? But also by events that we've had over the last uh, 15 years since the 2010 election. So I think the electorate is in a pretty grim and pretty angry state of mind. And uh, there isn't the same fear as 1997, although it's possible, not probable, but possible. The Labour majority if it gets wrong, which I'm pretty confident it will, may even be numerically ever so slightly larger than 1997. But it won't be that a new dawn has broken, has it not moment that we all remember from the morning after the election in 97. It was indeed a huge majority in 1997, 179 seats across a parliament of around 650 seats, of course. And, you know, it's not just you, quite a few of the betting sites are suggesting the majority, as things currently stand, could be even bigger. And yet, Matthew Laza, Keir Starmer, he's not Tony Blair, is he? No, he's not Tony Blair, and he'd be the first person to say that. I mean, I think the truth of the matter is, I'm not sure how well a Tony Blair-like figure would go down at the moment. Not least, actually, because the Tories had their own Tony Blair in Boris, very different politics, but, uh, you know, probably equaling each other in the charisma stakes. And I think that a lot of the Red Wall voters who went for Boris, basically, they backed uh, brand Boris and brand Brexit rather than brand Tory at the 2019 election. I think a lot of them feel incredibly cynical and incredibly jaded 
divided about what happened once they put their support in the Tories. So I'm not sure that this is the moment for a, I want for a better phrase, messianic leader in the uh, Blair or Boris mode. And of course, what happened after 97, when, you know, people like me, although, you know, we all had mixed views on the war, what happened with Tony is that some, many millions of voters dissipated somewhat as the Labour government unfolded, although it did a lot of good things. So I'm not sure it's the moment for that. And it getting embroiled in the war in Iraq. In particular, the war in Iraq, which obviously, you know, saw a lot of, quote, progressive opinion float away. So it seems to me that Keir is the man for the moment, uh, but it is a much more subdued moment uh, than 97, which makes it for a much duller election with no, without any doubt. Indeed. I mean, you'll remember that turnout during that 1997 election was very high. It was in the 70s, the share of the voting age population who actually turned up. How do you think turnout will be this time round, Matthew? And what do you think that says about the health of our democracy? So I think turnout will be kind of mid-ranking at this election. If you remember, it was in the 2001 and the 2005 election, particularly that 2001 election, which basically re-ran the 97 election. Labour's majority, I think, went down by two or, or, or if that. The, the turnout um, tanked. And that was the moment when the whole political conversation became about turnout and voter engagement. You know, more people voted in the early reality TV shows than voted in the 2001 election. I don't think it's going to be quite as bad as that. I think it won't be huge because I think people people do feel that the Labour government is a predictable outcome. Now, of course, that's difficult for Labour and all Labour's attention in the last 10 days of the campaign will be about turnout and will be about getting the vote out, what they call GOTV and acronyms of political organisers. Labour's policy towards gaining the keys to Downing Street has been described as a gorilla going across a tightrope carrying a Ming vase. In other words, be very, very cautious, very, very steady don't do anything that could cause any kind of offence. Given the size of Labour's potential majority now, Matthew, do you think there's something to be said for Labour maybe pushing the boat out a bit more and maybe getting more of a mandate by talking during the election campaign and in its upcoming manifesto about policies that more Labour voters would like to see? Is caution first always the best policy? No, I don't think caution first is always the best policy. I actually think that they're being more cautious than we were in 1997, not least because there were a lot of radical things that were in the 97 manifesto, which were mostly about societal change, everything from lesbian and gay rights, you know, equally in the age of consent, uh, uh, lesbian and gays in the armed forces, that sort of thing, all the devolution agenda, the freedom of information bill. There were actually things that didn't cost a lot of money, but were in stark contrast to what the Tories were offering. Now, you don't have that low-hanging fruit in the current climate. So that takes you down to kind of hardcore tax and spend policies. And that is where they are obviously being incredibly cautious. And what basically uh, happened, as you know, Liam, is that there was a sort of version of Bidenomics that Rachel Reeves put together, which is the 28 billion green investment plan in sort of uh, 2021, uh, 2022. But then as the cost of borrowing rose uh, sharply, they panicked. Uh, the trust government's experience did that as well. So now, economically, they're being incredibly cautious. In some ways, because the Tory tax on tax and spend, the Labour's greatest fear, you might understand why they're doing that. But actually, you know, is that being too cautious? And does that not provide enough of a mandate if actually, once in government, these kind of tiny incremental changes, you know, a a few thousand extra NHS appointments here, when you actually start to do big things, whether you've got the mandate, they would say, obviously, the bigger the mandate you get for the party and the direction of travel, the the, the more radical you have to be. And by radical, I mean, you know, I don't mean that this is is in any way that there's a sort of secret left-wing agenda. Uh, There isn't. But, you know, for example, if the cost of borrowing tumbles, borrowing to invest may become more attractive again. So, you know, obviously things will change. And I suppose there is a question about how big the mandate will be if you've got a kind of Stanley Baldwin caution first mandate. So that will be a dilemma. But obviously, from the point of view of the electorate, if they want a moderate Labour Party, the Labour Party leadership will be very aware that they've been handed a moderate mandate. But your huge experience in politics will inform you, Matthew, that what a party can do in power isn't just a function of the size of its parliamentary majority. It's a function of what it puts in its manifesto and therefore gets an explicit mandate for. If something isn't in your manifesto, the Lords can, in their eyes anyway, legitimately block it or make it very difficult for the government. Look at the fact that the Tories haven't got leaving the European Convention of Human Rights in their manifesto. That's a big reason many observers think why Sunak hasn't actually gone for that. What's the atmosphere around 
the Labour manifesto at the moment among party insiders. That text must be being rather hotly contested prior to publication. Well, actually, they were because they were thinking that there was going to be a spring election rather than a summer election. There was a lot of activity in terms of nailing the manifesto down before the uh, local elections, uh, so in March and in April. And so they will feel that they have nailed it down, that the costings are in place and that when it's unveiled, it will be scrutiny tight. So I don't think that there's a kind of lot of bickering at the last minute over it. I think there will be a question about how cautious this document is going to be. Tiny example, Labour post tooth and nail the bringing in of um, a photo ID requirement for voters for Westminster elections and local elections in England. But now they've been saying, oh, we're not sure we're going to get rid of it. I mean, a tiny thing. The Tories introduced it. People like Jacob Rees-Mogg are against it. Kind of you're being less radical than Jacob Rees-Mogg on a particular issue. That begins to worry me. So I think that they need to make sure there is enough interesting stuff in the manifesto that isn't just the very, you know, nailed down tax and spend things, but also that on things which aren't going to cost a fortune, but which can show the direction of travel and that the Labour government is going to have a more radical tinge. Because I do think that Labour is in danger of stoking up and building up a big issue to its left. We haven't heard too much from the election campaign, but the Greens you know, are still polling, at least at the same as the Lib Dems. And uh, you know, the, the fact that they are poised to capitalise uh, if the Labour government seems to be Tory light with those voters on the left could well become an issue once Labour gets elected. And frankly, it will be a bit of an issue in the election results itself. People you know, obsessed with reforms, impact on the Tory vote. Almost nobody's talking about the Green impact on the Labour vote. My personal instinct is actually the Greens gaining a, you know, a couple of thousand in a few seats might mean that that just takes 20, 30 off the Labour majority once you're talking about a majority into three figures. What is the biggest danger to your party, Matthew, as this election approaches? You've talked about the threat from the left. Is that really the thing that Keir Starmer will be most concerned about? Surely he'll be more concerned about, as Tony Blair was, appealing to Middle England. Doesn't he want to be seen to having a fight with the left? Isn't that what this Diane Abbott debacle was really all about? Yeah, absolutely. He's total focus will be on attracting Middle England voters. I mean, on the, on the Abbott affair, they were totally torn between uh, wanting to, you know, get those good headlines in the so, so-called right-wing media versus, you know, trying to deal with the party kickback on it. So I'm not saying that the focus shouldn't be on Middle England. I'm firmly a believer that you only win elections by winning converts from the, the main other party. You need to win over what they call Tory switches. What I do think, though, is that they need to be careful about storing up trouble if you want to have a two or three-term Labour government. We don't want to be seeing the Greens on 15, 16, 17% when things get a bit rocky in the early years of a Labour government because that causes you a huge political problem. So yes, you have to be laser-like focused on Middle England, but not forget your left flank. How dangerous is Labour's hard left flank to the party, both as a potential government and a party in government? Do you think Keir Starmer's really got the stomach to take on the Labour left, once he's thrown them the bone of VAT on school fees and business rates on school fees, what else do you think he will throw them? There are two different issues. I think there's the left inside the party and then there's the left force outside the party. So you say there are some pretty radical people in the Labour Party. There are always kind of 20, 25, 30 people on what you might call the hard left of the Labour Party. They were there the so-called campaign group, the campaign groups is kind of the, the way they organise and that's, uh, and so it's about, there's actually about the same number of them, slightly fewer. Now, the problem is that they are a larger percentage of the parliamentary party because the parliamentary party is at its lowest since before the Second World War. So at the moment, they stick out more like a sore thumb. Remember people like Dennis Skinner were there all the way through the Blair and Brown governments. Of the sort of 25 you've got at the moment, several of them aren't being allowed to restand again or have lost election battles. There aren't huge numbers of them in what's going to be a much larger parliamentary party and the key thing is, Liam, what Keir Starmer's done is he has controlled not just in these last minute replacements once the election was called. In the run up to the election, as candidates were being selected in winnable seats and seats where the MP had announced their retirement, he has absolutely controlled this with a Stalinist iron grip that would frankly put Tony Blair to shame. What he's basically done is effectively the national executive, which is the party's controlling committee on which he has a clear majority, has basically presented every constituency in the country with a shortlist and then the 
members and the constituencies get to vote from a pre-vetted shortlist, i.e. you don't get on the shortlist unless you, you know, can prove that you're a good Starmerite. That means that up and down the country in the most winnable seats and then on into the ones that they hope to win now, that they're more confident of victory. The candidates are have are sort of, you know, moderate through them like a stick of Blackpool Rock. That doesn't mean that they're all necessarily the most, you know, that they've got sort of exciting political backgrounds. Lots of them are local councillors campaigning in their communities. The idea that there's a kind of hidden selection of the hard left is just, is literally nonsense because the people around Starmer put in place this Stalinist selection procedure, which will mean you have a very moderate parliamentary party. So the 25 or so who are there at the moment, frankly, the likelihood of there being more than one or two joiners from all of the new seats coming in who will join the campaign, people will join the hard left. That's it. It's going to, they're going to get one or two extra. I mean, we just saw with Pfizer uh, Shaheen last week that she would have probably joined the campaign group. She's not an older candidate. They literally, their numbers are going to probably shrink and then as a percentage of Labour MPs, they're going to go right down. And yet there she is. She's an extremely telegenic young Londoner of Asian origin. She is an extremely effective campaigner on the ground in Chingford there in the outskirts of North East London. And she's odds on to be Ian Duncan Smith, which, you know, whatever you think of him, to be a former Tory leader would be an enormous scalp. Well, I think Labour's confident of winning the seat anyway. I mean, you know, I think there are certainly questions about the elegance of how she was treated. I mean, you know, recordings that we've heard of the Zoom call going on while her baby is crying are not a good look. And I think that that could have been handled a lot better. But the fundamental thing is that she was ousted not because of her political position. She, in effect, because she is so effective and because she was so embedded in that constituency, she was allowed to go ahead under the normal procedure. So the NEC let her go forward to her local constituency who then chose her. It was these particular tweets and social media posts, which Labour is being hawk-like, tip to anybody who wants to be an MP from any party, just think before you do anything on social media, is liking somebody else's post really going to help you in the long term or frankly help the causes that you believe in? So that's why she's gone. I think it should have been handled better. Are Labour in danger of disappearing down the same wormhole that Nicola Sturgeon disappeared down when it comes to trans rights and contested gender politics. Well, I think the answer is no, not if the leadership can help it, but how much pressure will there be on the leadership after the election? I actually think that, that, that this is your, this is a really key area because this is probably, in terms of what you might call left-right issues, the one that's going to be most contested because there are a lot of advocates uh, for transgender rights who certainly wouldn't regard themselves uh, as on the hard left of the party. And the issue is, is how strongly the mainstream LGBT lobby like Stonewall, which obviously has sympathy of a lot of uh, Labour MPs of all shades of party opinion uh, has. But is Stonewall mainstream, Matthew? Surely mainstream are the hundreds of thousands, I would say millions of particularly middle-aged women who are natural Labour voters who are utterly furious that your leader can't actually say what a woman is. Well, he can now after his sort of, you know, embarrassment. And that was clearly a communications disaster. And that is one of the issues with this is kind of middle-aged straight men have traditionally been a little embarrassed over some of these issues. Uh, you're talking to the man who had to explain various sexual practices to Ed Miliband on Victoria Station at 6.30 in the morning when we went to Brighton with the gay media in the 2015 election campaign. Labour's line on transgender issues now is the sensible one, which is to not be in favour of self-ID. And this is the line that the leadership will be very, very anxious to hold. Because actually, when you dig down into what the Tories are saying, it's effectively, I think you may well still see pride lanyards uh, on public sector workers under Labour, but you're not going to see self-ID for transgender people under Labour. Because frankly, I think there are two things. One, politically, it's a disaster. But also, as you say, there's a big build-up of steam about it, particularly amongst female MPs, which went a little bit under the radar. People like Rosie Duffield put their head above the parapet, but there was a lot of internal discussion under the parapet, below the parapet. And so I think you will see the line being held uh, on self-ID come what may. So voters who are concerned about this issue should be reassured about that. And I know it's hard, but put away some of the kind of embarrassing fudging earlier now that a hard position has been stuck to. Matthew, you and I talk about politics across the piece. I know you watch the Tories very closely. Who's the Tory leader post-election that Labour fear most? 
I think it's somebody like Penny Mordaunt. I mean, we've got to remember the chances of her holding a seat and winning the Tory leadership election combined are pretty slim. But it will be one of those mainstream Tories that actually don't seem very in favour within the Tory party itself. Now, the reason I say that is because look at history. We started the conversation talking about 97. Of course, what did the Tories do? I know he's now Mr. Moderate, but at the time, William Hague was seen as on the right of the Tory party with his save the pound flatbed truck, etc. And his kind of a core vote strategy, remember Anne Widdicombe was in his shadow cabinet, was seen to be what delivered Labour that repeat of 97 in 2001. So if you're Keir Starmer, if you're a Labour strategist and you want to see victory and a second term there, you want the most right-wing Tory leader you can, A, because that will create something of a civil war, which has happened after 97, but also because elections are won in the centre. And it's not just Labour that has to think about Middle England, it's the Tories too. They have to think about the whole of Middle England, which isn't just potential reform voters. So a moderate would be Labour's biggest fear and a sort of Farage takeover and the subsequent civil war would be Labour's ideal. Matthew Larza, great to have you here on Planet Normal. Total pleasure. There you go, Claire. Pretty clear-eyed analysis of where Labour are. What caught your eye, or should I say your ear? I think that the caution that you talked about and the way that Matthew said, oh, no, it's almost like common sense Labour, mainstream, you know, bit careful and so on and so forth. I mean it's hard for that to catch anyone's ear or eye so it doesn't catch the heart and it doesn't catch the mind very much if you're trying to win hearts and minds but one of the things that really struck me was when he was talking about you know yes the aim is to win middle england and you know to have our eye on tory switches is that it seems to me to have missed out the whole political realignment that happened in relation to 2019 which is that so many people who voted for the Conservatives in 2019 were actually Labour switchers to the Conservatives. And in other words, this new Labour administration is not interested in winning back in a straightforward way. It's working class base. You know, it's all of that kind of move away from what historically it was meant to represent. So that's one thing. The other thing is I'm absolutely not convinced that there isn't a seething morass of problems associated with identity politics within the Labour Party. I'm very nervous that, precisely because they haven't got very much money, and Matthew reminded us that, you know, even the Blair administration went for some low-hanging fruit, as he said, that didn't cost much money, use the example of devolution, and what a disaster that's proven to be. But the low-hanging fruit that I worry about is, and all I hear people in the Labour Party and the Lords talk about, are things like, you know, new hate speech legislation, you know, things that don't cost money but which are completely illiberal. There is actually a huge number of people in the Labour Party who want a version of self-ID in relation to the gender sex issue you raised. Rosie Duffield, nobody said sorry to her, so she might have stuck her head above the parapet. No, we say that on Planet Normal pretty much every week lately. Yeah, you've just said that completely unprompted. It's how a lot of people across politics feel. Apologise to the woman. She's completely courageous, decent person. People across the spectrum just apologise to Rosie Duffield, Keir Starmer. Exactly. It's, it just drives me mad, you know. They haven't done it. They won't do it. And actually, some of the... The big name voices in the Labour Party, Annalisa Dodds, Stella Creasy and so on, are completely swept up in the gender, you know, I'm a trans ally world and are demanding certain changes to the law. So now I'm not convinced that issue's gone away. But we also cannot forget one of the big issues of the day is the Israel-Gaza conflict and the impact that's having on the Labour Party. Starmer might, you know, certainly has held his nerve to a certain extent in relation to Israel, but you can see it fraying. David Lammy, quite a lot of Labour front bench, when they have spoken, much more keen to emphasise, no, no, we, we want a ceasefire. Yes, we want the hostages out, but we want a ceasefire. In other words, it's a real tendency to not take seriously the growth of a new visceral anti-Semitism, I don't mean now the same as the Corbyn stuff in the Labour Party. I mean, in cultural terms, they're much more susceptible to pressure from those students organising encampments or the big demonstrations. And that's obviously what the George Galloway issue represents. In some ways, the Pfizer Shaheen, that whole argument was about her liking anti-Semitic tweets, you know, and the Labour Party dealt with that. But now she's talking about standing as an independent. There's a lot of a mess around this issue, and I'm not quite sure 
I'm talking now if they get elected as a government, I'm not quite sure where Labour are going to land in terms of appeasing these trends, which they've cultivated because they cultivated identity politics, a rainbow of identities, rather than the working class, which they showed utter contempt for around Brexit in particular. But anyway, it's almost as though the kind of British working class and the embarrassing part of the Labour Party's tradition that they don't want to think about or talk about. And I just think... That is a betrayal, and it means that the Labour Party have got as many problems as the Tories, but it'll they just haven't imploded yet. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love to read your thoughts, the citizens of Planet Normal. This is from Tom on the theme often highlighted on Planet Normal – the high prices paid by UK firms and households for gas and electricity. So Tom says, Dear Alison and Liam, I'm an unpaid chairman of the Village Hall in the Midlands and on Saturday I received a call at 7.45am the burglar alarm was going off due to a power spike. Power spikes are common due to the multiplicity of electricity sources required to keep the grid energised and the constant switching between wind, solar, Belgian coal, French nuclear, UK gas, etc, etc. And as a lad, I lived around here and within a few miles of three Trent Valley fire, sorry, coal-fired stations and numerous coal mines. And these power spikes never happened in the 80s, 90s and the noughties. The mines and power stations are now long gone. So my village hall's finances are crippled by expensive electricity. Some members of our local community can't afford to heat their houses. So we received a £3,000 grant from the power industry to run a warm space soup kitchen from January to March of this year. A local solar farm has been built so it can be connected to the national grid adjacent to the abandoned power stations. The equipment was doubtless produced in China, where they are still building countless new coal-fired power stations. So, food production has fallen in a country already reliant on food imports and offering little sunshine during the winter when we face peak electricity demand. This huge solar farm is now also giving grants to local charities, funded by the green taxes on everybody's electricity bills that we can't afford to pay. This is insanity, piled upon insanity. Please, please, please let this end, Tom. Strong email there from Tom. This is from Roberta, not her real name, for reasons that will become obvious. We had a grandson, writes Roberta, who is now a granddaughter. She transitioned just as she entered puberty. This was some 13 years ago, so it's a time when her school didn't support her. In fact, her mother engaged in legal action to get the school to accept her right to wear girls' clothing and to be addressed as a girl. She would dress outrageously, tiny shorts, micro mini skirts, as if trying to provoke trouble, and even now at age 26, looks to me more like a drag queen than a regular woman. Her mother took her to a clinic in London to get puberty blockers. As a boy, she always had her head in a book and was clearly intelligent, got a place at university, but dropped out, and over the years, she's been involved in drug-taking and internet porn. Her world now revolves around the trans community, and she rarely visits her hometown and relatives. We disagreed privately with her mother championing her, because it was clear to us that the first step should have been serious psychiatric help, not a cursory interview at the clinic. Her mother separated from the father when the boy was about seven, and there was some talk of abuse on custody visits, either exposure to pornography or actual physical harm. We never got quite the full story. We convinced this led to a revulsion with her body and a fear of what puberty would bring. With proper help, she might have had a regular fulfilling life, instead of resorting to drugs to dull the pain. What I'm trying to say, writes Roberta, is that the dearth of mental health support for children means that fears that could be confronted are not being addressed, so are now being exploited by vociferous trans pressure groups. We've always been supportive of her and have never criticised her choice, but we feel she was seriously let down by the system. I've changed my name, writes Roberta, and not mentioned names nor locations to protect our dear granddaughter's privacy. Honestly, Liam, that was heartbreaking from Roberta, a tale of our time, and I wish that family good luck. This is a letter here from Charles 
on the pressure from some public sector unions that civil servants should work four days a week instead of five. Charles says, Dear Alison and Liam, if civil servants and council employees claim that they can do all their work in four days rather than five, surely a sensible management strategy would be to fire 20% of them and ask the rest to work as efficiently for five days. This novel approach would save money and would help to reintroduce the concept of actually working for a living. Taxpayers would benefit, the councils would be more popular and a small amount of common sense would have emerged. It's been a long time since I last studied economics, but as far as I can see, this novel approach wouldn't frighten the horses. Indeed, it could even be rolled out in the management suites of the NHS to good effect. Meanwhile, what on earth is going on with the Conservative Party candidate selection process? There seems to be no criteria of character, intelligence or basic common sense. So keep up the good work. I wish Planet Normal well and hope you continue to thrive in a universe where debate, politeness and common sense prevail. All the best, Charles. This is from Steve. Dear Alison and Liam, thanks for the sanity of Planet Normal, a weekly treat. On the hot topic of immigration, I urge advocates for much stricter control on legal immigration not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What I mean, says Steve is that if, and it's a big if, legal migration is slashed to the tens of thousands, it could destroy some families. For example, my wife, who's from Thailand, is on a 10-year road to British citizenship. It's a painful, slow and expensive process. She has worked her way up from being a bar staff in a pub in the Highlands to being a receptionist, office administrator, and now a manager at a workspace company in central Glasgow, all in the private sector. She's well-liked, respected, admired everywhere she works. She pays full UK taxes and also pays an NHS premium as a foreigner. We own our own house in Glasgow. I have my own small consultancy. Our three sons live with us. Two are working, one still at school. Every two and a half years, my wife also pays around £1,500 to the government and the NHS for a continuation of her leave to remain and work in the UK. As far as I'm concerned, my wife's an exemplary and aspiring UK citizen, as well as the cornerstone of our family. Her contribution to the UK is net positive by a country mile. If legal immigration is slashed arbitrarily to the tens of thousands, would my wife make the cut? Or would she and hundreds or even thousands of hard-working, law-abiding, mixed-marriage families like ours be sacrificed to some arbitrary immigration target? Any immigration system does need to be run on a fair-minded, points-based system. Arbitrary immigration targets sound attractive, right, Steve, but in re- reality, we need fairness first. A belief in family fairness and making a positive contribution to society is still the British way, isn't it? I actually think Steve raises some very good points there, Liam. But anyway, this is finally a letter from Harriet. You're welcome back, Harriet. Where have you been? I I, I was going (laughs) to say, that's not explained. I don't know whether you've been touring other planets or what. (laughs) But anyway, yes, welcome back. And Harriet says, I feel like Liam and Alison are holding my hand. That's very nice. And I think we're going to need to hold each other's hands as we navigate through the next few months and years. Harriet also says, congratulations on Planet Normal's two. 100th uh, episode and yes Hooray. this is Claire here now saying congratulations and I heard that you had a fantastic celebration last week but back to Harriet we the normal people have so much to thank you both for the time the effort the knowledge and the research the humour and the serious debate please can we persuade Lord Frost by the way to step into the Tory driving seat and guide the party back to something that we can vote for And thank goodness for people like Lionel Shriver, who have the skill and courage to put into words, and with such humour, what so many of us are thinking and feeling. Long live Planet Normal. Best wishes, Harriet. And hear, hear, Harriet. That's kind, Claire, and that's kind, Harriet. David Frost and Lionel Shriver were, of course, our guests at our live event in London last week. Thanks again to everybody who came along to Gadogan Hall and anyone who wants to listen to that live episode, it's an extended 200th episode anniversary special that's released last week as our regular Planet Normal podcast so you can catch it on our archive. And on that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week, it's my turn and I choose Tom 
who wrote about electricity supply spikes. Tom, please send us your postal address at planetnormaltelegraph.co.uk and a Planet Normal mug will be sent to you. And if you enjoy Planet Normal, please do leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really does help others to find the podcast so the Planet Normal family can grow. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal, the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view. Thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bajardo, Lampe Casso and Louisa Wells. And thanks also, of course, to the brilliant Claire Fox for keeping me company this week, helping to steer this rocket of right thinking, this capsule of common sense with such wisdom, good humour and aplomb. Alison will be back with us next week, presumably with more heavily and expensively certified Turkish street wildlife tucked into her beach bag. We miss you, co-pilot, and look forward to your sun-kissed return. Stay safe and in touch with us with each other until next week. It's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. And I will be listening uh, next time I'm on Planet Normal, which I always enjoy. (laughs) 